happening hi everyone i am mclean <laughs> i'm david yoon and we're here to celebrate talia and her wonderful book highly suspicious and unfairly cute here it is in glorious hardcover <laughs> glorious glorious which it is officially the barnes and noble ya monthly pick uh, and we couldn't be more thrilled it's also um not only are we working with the fantastic talia ever who it has a, already has a stellar career on writing adult romances, and this is her debut YA novel. Um, this is the first book for our publishing imprint, Joy of Revolution, which uh, has been sort of, I don't know, a dream of ours for years. Right, and we're going to talk about that later, but yeah. I'm going to introduce you. But let's talk about the book, and let's <laughs> Wait, talk about, oh, let's we're going to introduce each other. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, besides being married to me, David is the New York Times bestselling author of Frankly Love, Super Fake Love Song, and for adult readers, Version Zero and City of Orange. He's a William C. Morris Award finalist, an Asian Pacific American Award for Young Adult Literature Honor Book recipient. <laughs> Say that three times fast, you guys. Um, he's co-publisher of Joy Revolution. As Heavy said, it's a random house imprint dedicated to telling love stories by people of color, written by people of color. He is also the co-founder of Universe Media, which has a first look deal with anonymous content for film and TV development. David grew up in Orange County and now lives in LA with his wife and our child who's currently eating apples in the living room. Yeah, uh, <laughs> before her art camp class. So I'm gonna introduce Nikki. Uh, Nicola Yoon is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Instruction for Dancing, Everything Everything. The son is also a star and co-author of Blackout and Whiteout. Um, she's a National Book Award finalist, a Michael L. Prince Honor Book recipient, um, a Coretta Scott King New Talent Award winner, and two of her novels have been made into movies, uh, Everything Everything and Sun is Also a Star. Uh, so we co-founded Joy Revolution, the publishing imprint, as well as Universe Media, which uh, Nikki just talked about, and she grew up in Jamaica and Brooklyn and lives here with me. <laughs> and <laughs> so now, that's us. Right, so sorry, that's a long... I love thing. Now we're going to introduce the star of our show, Talia. <laughs> All right. Uh, you want me to do it? Go ahead. Okay. So Talia Hibbert, who you probably already know and you're all here for, is a New York Times, <laughs> USA Today, and Wall Street Journal bestselling author who lives in a bedroom full of books in the English Midlands. She writes witty, diverse romances. We're going to get to your wit in a second. Um, mm -hmm. including Get a Life, Chloe Brown, The Princess Trap, and A Girl Like Her, because she believes, like us, uh, that people of marginalized identities need honest and positive representation. So Highly Suspicious and Unfairly Cute is her debut novel for teens. Tommy's interests include beauty, <laughs> junk food, and unnecessary sarcasm. Is sarcasm ever unnecessary, Talia? I don't know. <laughs> Always appropriate. Right. <laughs> Hi, Talia. It's so great to see you. I know it's late for you. How are you doing? Good, thank you. It's great to see you guys. Thank you for such a lovely introduction. Um, it, it is late, but I'm just really excited to talk to you and to talk to everyone. So. All right, we're going to get started. And so for everyone out there, um, we're going to ask Talia a bunch of questions and have a little chit chat. And then we're going to ask you to ask us some questions um, with about maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes to go. Mm -hmm. We love questions. It's really, honestly, our favorite part of doing these events because you guys ask things that we never think yeah. of. So, you know, think of those really deep, necessary <laughs> to the Q and A box, or or the weird ones too. I love the weird ones. <laughs> all right, all right. So, Taya, please give us the pitch for our highly suspicious and unfairly cute. Okay, I feel like I should hold it while I'm pitching. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Um, a highly suspicious and unfairly cute is a YA rom-com about two 
former best friends who are now bitter enemies and academic rivals. Um, but they are forced to spend time together again when a wilderness expedition uh, sees them going to forests up and down the UK. Um, and when they do spend that time together, they remember why they used to be best friends and they realize that their obsessive hate for each other might be a sign of something else. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Enemies for Lovers is my absolute 100% favorite genre. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because the whole time they want to kill each other, right? And you're just waiting for them to go, oh, we should be kissing instead. <laughs> that <laughs> moment. <laughs> you know, but it does it in such a unique, it's, like, it's in such a Talia way that you could, I think you could write about anything really, like aliens in space and if you're if it's you writing it then i'm buying that book you know it's not <laughs> yeah, I was, i've actually read all of your books <laughs> including like the novellas like i read everything it's kind of shocking no <laughs> no i'm embarrassed <laughs> thank you right. oh yeah tell us what the inspiration for the book is okay so there were a few things that went into this um First of all, I live in kind of a rural area and especially over the pandemic and lockdown, I was taking a lot of walks and I'd be like, oh, it's like a really nice scenery out here for romantic things to happen because that's how my brain works. Um, so then obviously when I needed to come up with an idea for a book, I was like, they should definitely be in the woods. And it was also inspired by um, my own time at secondary school, there was a thing everyone used to do called the Duke of Edinburgh Award. I didn't do it because you had to go outside and camp. Um, <laughs> so that wasn't for me. But I was like, oh, that would be a fun like situation for hijinks to occur. Um, so I knew that was the kind of setting I wanted. And then the characters, I really just wanted to write characters that would be able to illustrate some of the key growing pains of being a teenager and being on the cusp of those adult choices. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, you, so you're like me, you're not in like an outside, like in the woods type of person. I'm not. I actually, um, to research this book, my fiance took me to Glenfinglass in Scotland, which is one of the forests in the book. And we went camping, which was my first time camping. And I cried and <laughs> we had to leave the next morning and go to a hotel. <laughs> I was like, this is horrible. <laughs> it's wet and cold. And right? Tell you this one thing. So David proposed to me while we were camping. I detest camping, but <laughs> it's like literally it's, it's happened. It was perfectly it practical and inhaled. And yeah. like they would say, it rained. It's, it was in New Hampshire mm -hmm. and it's the White Mountains and they call it the most changeable weather in the world. Oh and so God. we could buy all of that. But I... I don't know why we went, but we went camping. We're glampers at best, you know. Oh my God, that's so adorable and so funny because while we were on that trip, my fiance proposed to me. Oh my God. So we have the same, the same proposal story of camping horror. Oh my God. So we actually, it's like, like David melt in the snow and I was like, what are you doing? And then I don't know, we were proposing. Well, because it was dark because right. we're in the middle of the woods, oh, and, you know. That's so cute. <laughs> but I, just selfishly I love that you said in the woods because practically speaking we don't get to see a lot of like just black kids in the woods doing outdoorsy things that's true um that and that's just been sort of like this giant gaping hole in media and so the fact that we can actually add that to the universe is is really just joyful I was really so thrilled to see that just selfishly you know no definitely I feel the same way like there's you know there's a lot of diverse experiences that black people and all people of color have and when you're not seeing all of that in media it becomes very stifling so something like black kids in the woods that you don't see a ton that's a lot of fun to put into the world right. isn't this so silly though that we're, we're talking I mean, about, it's, it's so basic it's such a dumb thing to say about. <laughs> yeah, and, yet, is, and, yet. and yet so important you know <laughs> So the next question is, so this is your debut YA novel, and I'm going to ask you what the difference between writing for adults and writing for kids is. What have you found it to be? 
Okay, so first of all, when I sat down to think about this book and I was like, okay, this is different, this is YA, um, a lot of really beloved memories came up, not of the YA that I read as an, as an adult, which I do, but like of the YA that really shaped my reading experiences when I was younger. Um, so I started thinking about the things that I loved from that experience and I came to the conclusion that I wanted the book to feel like a positive reflection of the reality of being in that kind of transitional age. Um, and also, I just wanted to make sure that it was like super, super fun. Um, and everything when you're younger, I think, feels a lot more intense and urgent. And I really wanted to get that onto the page. And also, your world is so full of people when you're like at school because now I'm an adult and my job is like to sit in this room and I don't see anybody. Whereas when I was at school, you were constantly seeing people whether you wanted to or not. And so I really wanted to reflect that with like a big cast of characters as well and have all these different friendships and relationships. Um, so I think those were the key things that I really had to think about and do differently. Right. So, honey, I mean, sorry, David. <laughs> you also right for adults and for young adults what do you feel like the difference is uh, mostly I mean I with with the young adult um, the audience is really looking for a lot of teachable moments you know um, and there's a lot of educators who are using our books to teach their kids and there's a lot of librarians who are using our books and so as a result why it kind of tends to deal with um, stuff that has been answered um, and you know and I think that adult literature, on the other hand, is more okay with stuff that hasn't been answered yet. It's more about pointing at the question, like, this is messed up, there's a problem here. Whereas in YA, it's sort of like, comes from more of a place of hope and a place of mostly joy. Um, even in the dark fantasy books, I think they come from a place of hope. Uh, whereas adult, I, I don't know, it can be kind of nihilistic sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> a little bit different. Yeah, I do think that the... Why books? I mean, I don't know if this question is so much that has been answered already, but it is a hopeful spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, because adults sometimes close their worlds down. Um, mm -hmm. They stop questioning. But in YA, the kids are always questioning, right? It's part of growing up is, you know, trying to figure out who you are and the meaning of life and all that, that good stuff. And, and I think why really engages with that in a way that maybe adult stuff doesn't have to because people are struggling with other things, right? Yeah. Sure. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go back to um, your banter because my favorite thing about your books, all of them across the board is that you were so witty. Why? <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I have writer envy like, when I read it. What happened to you as a child? <laughs> to, to make you so witty it's I'm, I'm telling you you could write about you could write about a zombie apocalypse and it would be hilarious and witty as hell yeah you could write about oh, anything. Yeah. also do write about the zombie apocalypse <laughs> i would read the outline book. <laughs> <laughs> wow well thank you it's funny because in real life everyone who knows me is like stop making jokes you're not funny so I think all my wit is pulled into writing because when i'm like talking and i try and make jokes it never works <laughs> <laughs> so when you're writing your banter, right? I mean, sometimes when I write dialogue, I'll like read it out loud and talk back to myself, like as I, I'm like both per people. Yeah, it's not weird at all. <laughs> <laughs> Telling jokes to yourself. <laughs> so do you do that? Like, how does it? How do you? How do the jokes work in your head? Are you just trying um, to make your laugh, basically, or? Basically, yeah, I do the same thing, like talking to myself as both people and. I'll, I'll do it in the shower or when I go on walks that's where I think a lot so everyone in my town probably thinks that I'm just like talking to myself constantly which <laughs> isn't inaccurate <laughs> um, and yeah when I'm doing it and like if it makes me go oh you know that's funny then it goes in the book <laughs> and the darker that huh, is the better yeah <laughs> yeah um okay uh so I don't want to give away too much from the book, so I'm going to sort of move away from talking about the book specifically and just talk about um, your writing process. We, we, can you tell us a little bit? Because I know we always have a lot of writers and aspiring writers at, at these events, and we really want to just make sure that we, they know that we go through the same things. So can you tell us a little bit about your writing process? Yeah, well, the first thing I'll say is that I feel like 
before you've written a book you feel like oh everyone who's written a book knows what they're doing and it must be way easier for them and I'm doing everything wrong but actually the more you write books the more you're like ah, I don't know how to write a book even though I've supposedly done it before <laughs> when was that who was that so oh, <laughs> for me my process seems to change every time um if I go to a book and I'm like well I wrote the last one like this so I'm going to do that again it never works um but some consistent things are that I always tend to start with characters um or I have like characters in one part of my brain and then I have kind of setups and situations and I'll like slide them together and see which ones fit together nicely and sort of which situations bring out the best in which characters um so with this one I definitely had the idea of like the setting I wanted it in and I knew that they were going to be like enemies and rivals and then I was creating the characters and when I created the characters and I thought about how they would be with each other I was like okay they need to have been friends before they were enemies because the way I want them to be enemies they need to know so much about each other and yeah. it needs to be like deeply personal <laughs> so I think I started there and then when it comes to process I really like to um, basically copy everyone else so I'll google like how to write a book and then <laughs> you get all these things about story structure right so I just go oh that one looks good and like mix and match different elements of story structure kind of like Frankensteining a way to write a book um, and the book finished so I guess it worked. <laughs> I love that you said that about structure because people can tend to poo-poo structure a lot saying, oh, it's just formulaic, you're following the formula. And I go, yeah, like an apple pie recipe. And I love right? apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> formulas can be good, actually. <laughs> and I love that you said that um, they need to really know each other in order to be enemies. Because I've you know read and seen enemies to lovers where they don't know each other and the animosity kind of comes from nowhere. Right. Um, so I thought that was just so smart that you based it in something with history. Right, so, I mean, you can only really hate someone that you really loved at one point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, the other thing that you said that struck me as so smart is that the more the more books you write, <laughs> the <laughs> worse it's, the harder it is to write books. And it's uh, just 100% true. And I, why? With anything else, it's like, oh, you get better. <laughs> right? Right, that's just, exactly. No. But with books, <laughs> Get trash it's like you get worse and worse it's horrible <laughs> yeah. yeah um i mean for me my process is um i write into my notebooks i write by hand um i once tried to type first no did not work <laughs> no it was really, yeah so i write um really early in the morning for most of the day to my notebooks and then uh every three or four days i type whatever i've written into mm -hmm it's like my first revision um so that's that's the process but other than that that's the only thing that remains the same through books everything else is up for grabs like yeah what, yeah the schedule i mean or the the actual physical or like what what, doing. what motivates it right like mm -hmm. sometimes it's an idea sometimes it's like a voice or a quote or whatever a voice in your head yeah that's not weird <laughs> <laughs> i mean i write let's see i write 25 minutes at a time and then like the pomodoro method or you do 25 minutes and then five minutes of just whatever you want. Um, so I'll get up. It's important to just get up and like fold some laundry or do some dishes or take a shower. Um, yeah, he's a putterer. He will like walk around like, our house changing things. I'm like circling. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so then another uh, sort of more general question. Have you always wanted to be a writer? And if you weren't writing, what would you be doing? Gosh, yeah, I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, like when I was younger it was like I want to be either a superstar or a writer and I would have been equally happy with either option <laughs> um, and you got both <laughs> I was thinking more like Beyonce with the superstar thing but this is great too <laughs> Beyonce doing um, reading on the stage <laughs> I um I just really loved books so much that writers seemed like so incredible to me and the idea of making a book was like wow so yeah I've always wanted to do this and I think if I wasn't doing it I probably would be doing like marketing or advertising or something like that because 
I feel like you have a lot of similar skills and it's about making like a smaller story. And that's what I like is just stories. That's so funny. I, I worked in advertising for like really? five, for, for too long. And <laughs> 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 we did something creative every day. I was exercising my creative brain every day and yeah. it's still satisfying is writing books. Like when I would get up early in the morning and work on my stuff, that's when I felt like the real work had been done. Mm. And now it's a job because now that's that's the easy stuff. Um, <laughs> funny that you said that. It was still fun. It's like being in high school. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I weren't writing books, I would absolutely be a food critic. There's just no question in my mind. Like international food critic. Listen. Traveling the world. I would travel the world. I would eat at like, I would eat at food trucks. I would eat at Michelin places and I would get to write about it. And I would get to eat. <laughs> that's my job. I love that. Yeah. I might, I might still try to do that. What would I be? Music composer. That's what I would be. I would compose music for films. That's what I would be. Rock oh. opera? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, Talia, can you see yourself trying out any other genres like sci fi, horror, fantasy? Um, I really love fantasy and sci fi, like space operas. So, I, I really want to try those out. It's just a question of, do I have the galaxy brain necessary to invent things like that? I'm not sure. <laughs> I think you do. I, I say a romance fantasy. I know someone who would publish it. <laughs> <laughs> We're here, call, call us. <laughs> I mean, I everything good is a mashup anyway, mm. you know? Like when Kazuo Ishiguro writes about AI robots, that's just gonna be good. If Tali Gerber writes a, a space opera, that's gonna be good, just automatically. It's <laughs> all about love anyway. Yeah. Like all the books well, are about love. Well, everything's about love, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> um, okay, so do you have any advice for writers just starting out? Yeah, I feel mm. like we have writers in the audience tonight. Um, so some words of wisdom. Oh gosh, okay. Now I'm trying to think of something wise. Um, I think, you know, my main advice is to don't be afraid of what you want or intimidated by it. Just kind of commit and believe that you can do it. Um, because, you know, writing a book, writing anything, but I know writing a book specifically is such a huge undertaking and it can take so much time and be so scary and you can be stuck in it for so long thinking like, am I ever going to do this? Because there's no evidence that I am. Um, and really, you're the only one in control of that. So just believe in your ability to keep going and, and you will. Right. That's, that's lovely advice, David. Yeah, because you you're alone in a room by yourself. And I mean, the only other advice is like find a writing partner who you mm. really really or just someone who can read your stuff. Who, okay, critique writing. Who's yeah. serious. If you can afford it, I know it's expensive, but go to writing school because that's where you're, you'll find people who are willing to pay money. That's how serious they are about writing. Um, <clears throat> if not, then you can, there's plenty of tools online where you can find communities um, of like-minded writers who you can share your stuff with uh, and, and trust them that they'll be as serious as you. Uh, I happen to live with my favorite writer. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it makes it really easy to bounce ideas and get feedback and Make sure I'm not writing. Commiserate. Oh my God. Make sure I'm not writing something bizarre and unpublishable. Um, and really, just anything to, to make you feel no, less alone, because <laughs> it's so solitary. I mean, it is very solitary, and you're like a troll. <laughs> my room. Um, I mean, I guess, especially for writers just starting out, I think that you got to embrace the weird, right? Like. I always say, let your freak flag fly, right? Because like the part of you that's mm -hmm. weird um, and different than everyone else is what makes your book different than everyone else's. Um, if I gave everyone on this call the same prompt, we would have like as many people are different stories, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're all, um, we're all different. So and just a, really- A practical way to do that, just like for, to automatically kind of get in that mode is to get up at four in the morning. Get up really crazy early. <laughs> we used to do this. We to, just once in a while we do this. We get up really early. Well, uh, we used to do it every morning. Yeah. I don't know how we did that. But when you're up that early, your inner editor is still asleep and you just start writing the, the, the wackiest stuff. And you look at it in the light of day in the afternoon and you're like, I can't believe I wrote that. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're editing yourself. 
Yeah, and you were you were letting that freak flag fly. Yeah, really. Um, okay, so oh, I do actually have one more piece of advice um, for writers, and at this one, I think it's really important. Is it's more philosophical than practical, right? So the practical advice is, you know, it's just right. You have to do it. Like you just gotta. You can't mm -hmm. think about it. Like you can't revise a blank page. Get through that first draft. All writers wrestle with doubt, right? Doubt is like a part of the process. Who said the your, the first draft is you telling the story to yourself? Mm. I think it was Henry. I'm Henry? not sure. Yeah. He drank a lot. No. Um, <laughs> but you do have to get through it, and then you can revise it. You can make anything better. You can't make nothing better, though, mm -hmm. right? So you got to get to the end. But the more philosophical advice is, you know, I think especially for people of color, the world is very, very good at telling you who you are and who you're supposed to be, right? It's very, very good at putting you into a box. Um, and you gotta just ignore it. You just, you gotta get out of that box, right? You gotta just get rid of everyone else's expectations of you and do the thing that makes you happy, right? I mean, don't hurt people, but get out of that box. Like no one gets to, you get the one life. No one gets to tell you what to do or who to be. Um, and I think that's really important. Yeah, it's tricky. It takes, um, you gotta be a little bit courageous to do it, but I think it's worth it. I mean, it's definitely worth it. The, the alternative is, we, we know the alternative. It sucks, it's, it sucks. It's <laughs> <You don't wanna. laughs> um, okay, so will you tell us a little bit about your journey to publication? Um, and I guess I'm thinking of like on the adult side and then you can come back to the YA side and then maybe we'll just all talk a little bit about Joy Rev. Joy Revolution before we open it up to questions. Okay, so for me, um, I started out self-publishing, um, which I do still love. Um, and essentially I was at university, I was in my final year and I knew when the year ended, my student loan would run out and I would have to get a real job. Ah, so I thought now seems like a good time to give the writing thing a try. Um, I had been reading a lot of books that were by self-published authors and I had noticed that they were self-published. So that's when I was like, oh, this is like a cool thing that I could do. Um, so I just gave it a go. I was very um, fortunate that, well, unfortunately, my grandmother passed away, but I was fortunate that she left me some money. And so I was like, OK, I can like start a business with this kind of um, and so it seemed like a something she would have wanted me to do. So I think that was the main thing that pushed me to finally finish a book and sell it to people. Um, Interesting, yeah. But the first book only sold two copies, I think, and one of those was me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the second book was maybe like 10 copies or something. Um, but then the third book actually did much better, like people I didn't know read it. Um, and that's when I was like, oh, it's working, like keep going. So I wrote just as much as I possibly could for like the whole of that year, because I was like, this is my chance to do it. And if I can't make it work by the end of the year, I have to do something else. So I kept at it. And by the end of the year, I felt like I have evidence that I can make this an actual job. Um, so that's how I started out writing. I just gave it a go and then kept going, I guess. And it has yet to not work out. So I'm just going <laughs> to keep riding the wave. <laughs> that's amazing. That's so amazing. I have a question. So what made you keep going after number one and number two, after only two people read that first book? Like what inside mm -hmm. of you made you do it? So when I wrote the first book, I had tried to write things ever since I was a kid, but I'd never actually finished anything. And then I managed to finish that first book, but it was very, very short. It was like 17,000 words. Um, I don't know how many pages that is, but it's very short. Um, so when no one wrote it, I was kind of like, well, that's okay. Cause that was my practice one just to prove that I could do it. And then the next one I wrote was like 30,000 words, which is like novella length. And I was like, well, it's doing better than the other one. So if I just keep writing more and getting better, Yes. it will sell more <laughs> um so i guess just optimism um yeah. and, and i was excited that things were happening you know at the time like two or ten people buying it was like oh this is a big deal so that in itself motivated me i guess low expectations was <laughs> 
I was among Please that. Don't. Um, I that, mean, that would be so discouraging for me, but for you, it was fuel. And you did the one thing that lots of people just can't do, which is to finish something. It's so important just to finish, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that you honed that, that discipline, I think it's just so impressive. And persevere though, mm -hmm. right? Because I mean, I wrote books before my first book got published and no one will ever publish them. They're not, they're terrible, yeah. right? No, <laughs> they're not good. <laughs> But I mean, I do think that um, that perseverance is something that young authors really need to know. You know, you just gotta, you gotta stick with it. You know, half of this, this sort of career is just keep going, do it again and again, get better and better. Yeah. You guys keep, I'll be right back. <laughs> That's an alarm going off, like uh, just an iPad alarm going off. <laughs> it's been driving us insane. <laughs> But I mean, yeah, that perseverance is just so important, you know, like even between my second and third books, oh, I wrote really? a book that failed in between, just like it was not good enough to publish. Um, and it was hard to keep going after that one, but it did. And then I made another book and, you know, that's just perseverance. And practically speaking, I, would, I mean, people say like, don't quit your day job. You're, you want to be a writer? And actually, it's really good advice. Like, don't quit your day job. <laughs> uh, and her written which you know, I'm sorry to hear about your grandmother, but I think she she would have been so proud of you um, with what you did with your inheritance from her. Um, and your job is kind of like your inheritance. It, it's what you need to so that you don't have to worry about the basics and you can focus on your art. Um, and so, do keep your day job. I think it's great advice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we kept our day jobs while mm -hmm. we were starting out. Um, it's hard to write and be creative if you're worried about money and food mm. and healthcare and um, your kids. And, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I wrote for years from 4 to 6 a.m. and kept my day job because I couldn't. I mean, I needed healthcare. I had a child. And I, I don't know how we did that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, a little bit about your journey to young adult publishing. Well, when I heard about Joy Revolution and your mission, I was like, this is perfect like this is exactly what I think and feel about like books and the role that our writing can have in the world and the idea of writing like love stories about people of color that were just about joy that really spoke to what I want to do creatively and also just what I want like the force that I want to be on the planet um so I was really excited by it and it really sparked my imagination obviously I'd never written YA before and my first instinct was like, I don't know if I can write YA. Um, but then that thing happens where, you know, when you read a lot of something and yeah. you're like, oh, I don't know how to do this. But then actually you like have absorbed so much from reading that you're like, maybe I do. Um, so I started getting ideas. And from there, I got excited because like, if I think that maybe I can do something, then I'm like, okay, I've got to prove it, got to do it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's wonderful. Cool. I'm so glad that like the mission of Joy Rev spoke to you because oh really so anyway, and I could not believe when you like decided that you would write for us. I was like, we, I'm gonna die now. We were all screaming and running around. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because because your adult books just get it. You know, they they naturally uh, mesh with our mission, and our mission is so simple. It's um, it's just showing people of color just being normal. Uh, just like living their lives, giving them the full breadth of their humanity, okay. letting them be goofy, make mistakes, aspirational, um, yeah. vulnerable, be the prettiest girl in the room, yeah. or like the prettiest boy, right? Because um, a lot of times, you know, the the the, the BIPOC story is one of um, pain or trauma or racism or or whatever, and. You know, we absolutely need those stories because if we forget about the struggle, then that's because the not world, good. right? I mean, the world yeah. is what it is, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we these stories, nothing is fixed, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, we are getting there so slowly, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I see the gamut yeah. um, of story types, and we've got you know the trauma stories pretty well established, and there's this huge gap of stories that are not being told. Um, and we just want to fill in those gaps. And mm. you were like our first and most perfect choice. Um, so 
Yeah, and then and we thought about dry revolution because we met in graduate school and we'd been thinking mm -hmm. about doing something like dry revolution for years, but we had no way to do it. And it wasn't until like we became authors ourselves and like had some level of, of success that we could say, oh, maybe we can give this a go. And so um, I reached out to Barbara Marcus, who runs Random House Children's Books, and I pitched, David and I pitched her the idea. And, you know, she like was like, I'll think about it, write something up. And so then we wrote something up and then we sent it. And then like, I didn't, we didn't hear for like two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I was in my office and I got an email and Barbara was like, this is great, we should do this. And it was a very short email and I screamed like bloody murder <laughs> in my office. <laughs> David came running and he's like, what is wrong? And, died, I, was, <laughs> and I was like, I gotta start a new book. It, yeah, it's we it's it's been such a pleasure to get manuscripts of your caliber and other authors who are just fantastic. And there's a whole um, supply out there. There's writers who want to tell right, their stories. Right. It turns out there are a lot of authors mm -hmm. of color writing joyful, just some beautiful, funny, witty stories. I mean, I fell in love every day in high school, right? So I know black girls fall in love. <laughs> <laughs> the media. Yeah, you never right? see those stories. I call it the. I how the Kumar go to White Castle um, standard of achievement. <laughs> uh, where that, you know, that movie where it's just like this Korean American guy and an Indian American guy, and they they both just want to get high and get burgers, and that's it. <laughs> you know, nothing about being oppressed. There's no pain. There's no trauma. They're and they're as stupid as they want to be, and it's beautiful. And so that's always been like my lo my load star or whatever. Right? Yeah, I mean, we've always just light. wanted that, right? Like all the great love stories should include everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as David said, we need to show the full breadth of everyone's humanity, right? And we get to have joy because it's true. We have joy. Just right? the normal things. That's right. Yeah. Just <laughs> look at the comments popping up. <laughs> all right, party people. We have arrived at the part that we love the most, right? So we got the Q and A. Tally, you've got a bunch of questions coming at you. Uh, oh, gosh. A bunch of questions. Okay, so here we go. So the first one is from Brittany Nevitt. Um, and please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Um, I don't mean to. Okay. So when you think about the first book you ever wrote and compare it to your most recent book, what observations have you made about your growth? What have you learned over the years? Oh, gosh. Well when I wrote that first book I didn't really know anything I was doing an English degree um, and I took a creative writing option um, but it turns out there's a lot of forms of creative writing that are not writing a book so <laughs> I don't think we've got to that module yet so I didn't really know what I was doing um, I just was like I want them to kiss and <laughs> everything I wrote was just like them getting together and then I knew that they were supposed to break up so I was like and then they broke up and but then they got back together again <laughs> so I think figuring out the important beats to hit in a story you know in any story you need things like a beginning a climax and end you need to have something at stake and then more specifically the things that you want to see in a love story and these are things that I was able to pick up just by writing, things I was able to pick up by reading more as a writer and like switching on my brain when I was reading instead of just having fun. Um, and also by researching, like I love researching and taking classes and reading blog posts. Um, so I think just trying at every opportunity to get a little bit better is the main difference. Um, that's great. I mean, reading the... Margaret Atwood always says, read, 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 and write, write, write. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's exactly what you're talking about. It's just like, read all the stuff you want to know about, and that'll inform you about how you write. Yeah. Um, so we've got so many questions. Uh, this one is from uh, Amy Juarez. Uh, which of all the characters you have written is most like you? And which character do you most want to be slash aspire to be like, oh. and why? OK. so. Off the top of my head, who I most aspire to be like is actually Celine from I Was Suspicious <laughs> and I'm Fairly Cute because she's 
incredibly cool she doesn't i mean she has a lot of feelings she's actually very soft deep inside but she's very committed to just being taking everything in her stride and also she's a complete go-getter and she figures out what she wants and she's like okay step one two three to get it and we're off and I love that so much and I find that so inspiring I'm not very assertive or decisive um like I have a daisy on my nails I didn't want because the guy wanted to do it and I didn't want to say no so <laughs> um so I really aspire to be more like Celine um the character who is most like me is probably um, Chloe Brown from my adult rom-com girl life, Chloe Brown, um, because she stays in the house, she eats a lot of chocolate, she watches TV, and she does her work, and that's basically what I do. <laughs> Listen, Chloe's got to go now. I love Chloe. <laughs> All right, um, let's see. Uh, from David Goodman. When you were self-publishing, were you also self-editing? How did you decide when your story was polished enough to go to print? Okay, so at first I was self-editing because I was really trying to ration my money. Um, so I had like a, um, it's like a software, I think it was called Pro Writing Aid or something like that. Um, and you could like run it through and ask it to check various things. And that was like the most editing I had aside from myself. Um, wow. And then, you know, the more books I wrote, when I started kind of getting income from the books, I was like, okay, now I can like invest things. Um, and the more editing you can get, always, always it's for the better because like editing is actually a whole, it's like a big chunk of a writing process that really makes the book what it is. Like your editor can completely help you create the book. And it's like that conversation, um, it's sort of like I know people in like tech and stuff talk to rubber ducks. I've heard oh, yeah. rubber ducks <laughs> for like Ducky. ideas, um, just to like work through things in your head. And when you have an editor, it's kind of like that, but better because they're not a duck. They're like smart and they know what they're doing. Um, so I was self-editing for a while. I would not want to go back to that. And um, if you can, editing is one of the things that you should like sacrifice other stuff for. I, I mean, totally agree. Yeah. And my editor is just so much smarter than I am. And she absolutely <laughs> always knows. You know, and you, know, you develop a relationship too. Like, so the great thing about having an editor that knows you is that they know you, right? So they know what you're trying to say and maybe that you're missing it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not so much saying to you, this is how you fix this, but sort of pointing out to you where you're not convincing this part mm -hmm. of the not doing the thing that you wanted to do. Um, and it's invaluable yeah. to get that. Although there is practical stuff too, like my editor, Mark Tavani, he was like, this is awesome. I love version zero. Uh, should there be a mano a mano with the bad guy? And I was like, right. <laughs> it was so obvious. <laughs> um, but first, what? let's ask a question. Okay. Um, okay, take another question. We'll take this one. Are there more books coming soon for Joy Revolution? Yes. Absolutely. Yes, there are. <laughs> um, the next one is called Creepy, and it comes out on April 4th. And we'll talk more about that um, soon. Um, but basically, it's a uh, furniture in the meets of Town of Monte Cristo. Yeah, it's a revenge story. Awesome. Um, okay, I love this question. Okay. From Shelby Destine. Now that you've made this adventurous and I might say incredible step into YA, do you see yourself staying in this genre for a while? I've really enjoyed writing YA, and I feel like as if you can do like a wide range of things it's really great for your creative brain as well and I found it really rewarding to write for a younger audience as well not just because I have a lot of younger people in my life who haven't been able to read my books and now I'm like you get a book and you get a book because it's appropriate um, <laughs> so I think so yes <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, we keep getting ourselves because there's a lot more going outside. Forgive us, <laughs> everyone. There's a truck rally going on right out there. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, 
Let's see. What's a good one? There's so many good ones. Um, um, Angela wants to know what what were some of the YA books you read as a teenager. Oh, okay. So I loved Meg Cabot when I was a teenager, um, the Princess Diaries series, and also the Mediator series, um, which I feel like is slightly less known than the Princess Diaries, but it's super cool because she can see ghosts and she fights them a lot. And then she gets in trouble because no one else can see the ghosts. So they're like, why are you making a mess? And I look, I really loved that. <laughs> um, what else did I read when I was? I used to read like a lot of YA fantasy. Um, the Windsinger Chronicles, which I'm actually not sure if that's technically YA or if it's middle grade. Um, and I also don't know if that was one of those things that was more popular here in the UK than in the US. So I don't know if anyone has read those, but if you can read them, you should, because they're super cool. Um, they're like fantasy and there's lots of journeys and there's some sort of like apocalyptic stuff it's cool there's a princess in a caravan it's cool i liked it a lot did you see the one that just popped up no you can't ask so there's a question that just popped up would you would you partner with another writer and, and who would be oh <laughs> gosh about that I am so stressed out by the idea of co-writing because when you have to do like group projects at school I would be the person who's like, I have to do everything because you will all do it wrong. So <laughs> I don't know if I would be a very successful, I don't know if I have what it takes to be a co-writer. <laughs> um, I feel like it would be very fun for you two to co-write something. Yeah, we might be doing that. We might be doing As that. As we speak. Uh, okay, so is there a book that you found the easiest to write? And this this question is from Leilani. Is there a book that you found the easiest to write uh, or the hardest to write? Mm, the easiest to write? Um, well, I have this thing where after I've written the book, I'm like, oh, that was so much fun. But during the book, I'm like, this is the worst time I've ever had. <laughs> um, um, but I think possibly the hardest book to write was Take a Hint, Danny Brown, just because it was the second book in a series and the first book had been quite well received. So obviously, instead of feeling positive, I was like, it's never going to be as good. And I got in a big panic and I just made it a real issue for myself and it didn't need to be. Um, the funnest, no. the funnest, like this one was really fun because it's pink um and because it was different that was fun it was something like fresh and and I put a lot of jokes and silliness in which I very much enjoyed yeah I mean it's it's there's so much joy and this pure witty goodness in this book I mean it feels I mean I know that writing can be hard and it can look effortless and if you're doing it really well it seems effortless but those especially are the hardest oh my god oh my god I swear <laughs> that the lawnmower is coming inside <laughs> Close in half. <laughs> okay, here's a more philosophical one. How do you deal with the loneliness of writing? Mm, it's it's quite difficult, especially because I'm naturally introverted, which you'd think would make it easier, but then the problem is. I sort of sit on my own for too long and I'm like, this is fine. And then suddenly I'm having a mental crisis and I'm like, how did this happen? Because I haven't left the house in like 10 days. So I think setting boundaries for yourself um, and kind of trying to think of yourself as an employee and trying to be a good boss to yourself um, and thinking, you know, humans should talk to other humans on a regular basis. Therefore, I'm going to prioritize going to the library, going to the coffee shop, setting up phone calls or like fun times with my friends on purpose because it's not just going to happen. Yeah, yeah that's very true. We feel the same. Yeah. One of the things that people don't quite realize is when you become a writer, you're actually starting a small business mm. uh, and you are your own boss and your own uh, first employee. Yeah. And we you do- You either be a good boss or a bad boss. A cool boss or bad We're, we're our own. <laughs> all yeah. the time like yeah. we work too much we forget to take breaks um, we, we forget to celebrate stuff um, mm. 
So we're like the unfun office sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that it comes from a good place though. Mm -hmm. Like we are just very incredibly passionate about mm -hmm. him and now publishing. Um, you know, it's, we get to do this. And it's the best thing in the world, right? Like we can't, yeah. I'll do it all day. I'm sorry, but. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, let's go on some more questions. All right, I think we have about six minutes left. Um, let's see. Hello. I saw one pop up. That said, you get I saw one pop up that said, um, what is your writing kryptonite? Which I thought is an interesting question. It could be taken a number. Yeah, gosh. So, I mean, the two things I think of are like, what things in general can stop me from writing and then like what thing is super difficult to try and write um and I think things that prevent me from writing is if if something is up like with me personally and I haven't addressed it which happens a lot because I'll be like oh I have to go to work I don't have time to sit and think about my feelings but when your work is coming entirely from your brain you kind of have to sit and think about your feelings um and then the hard stuff to write, I find it really difficult to write places. All of my books naturally happen in like a floating blankness. And then I have to painstakingly build walls around the character. He's the same. Oh my God. <laughs> How do I get them Our space. It's like, <laughs> where are these people? <laughs> Why, why is there, there's no weather, there's no scenery, there's no... 100%. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. Yeah, I have to go back and like build actual infrastructure. <laughs> Remember the team, you know, Sun is also a star, there's a whole scene where it's all about just coffee cups. Yeah. And I was like, you can ease up on the coffee cups. <laughs> <laughs> You're in a cafe. <laughs> you can only have dialogue, that's what I would do. I would just have dialogue. I could, but so, no one will let me. So please. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I think gosh. I have time for one more. Um, we could do two more. We could do two. We could do two more. Let's see. Mm. All right. Who are your favorite writers? Gosh, I struggle to pick. Well, I can pick favorites, but it's just like a very, very long list. Um, yeah. And then. <laughs> or just oh, not top five. Oh, five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just like. <laughs> Okay, um, I love Kennedy Ryan. Um, oh no, I've instantly forgotten everyone I've ever read. <laughs> I feel like I want to say you two, but then I would feel very embarrassed. <laughs> um, I love Kennedy Ryan. I love KJ Charles. I love um, Beverly Jenkins. I love, gosh, I'm looking at my bookshelf. I love Tasha Suri. Um, people to choose from okay and I really love Vanessa Riley that's it, that's it. That's it. <laughs> I always hate this question I'm so sorry I didn't see it's like choosing children yeah cool all right really the last two questions um, um let's see this one? Oh, the name of the publishing imprint again Rhonda Rhonda Naim Naim is Joy of Revolution that's an easy one I'll answer that one uh, <laughs> Alice M wants to know, do you find listening to music or creating playlists helpful to your writing process, either as motivation or to connect with your characters? I really love making playlists for like the vibe and energy of either the book or the characters. Um, I can't listen to music while I'm writing, but like when I'm thinking about what I'm going to write, I like to listen to it um, and it gets great ideas in my head. Um, and sometimes listening to songs will like inspire ideas for characters or situations because music is so creatively stimulating yeah I always say that I would love to write a book that makes you feel the way a really good like pop or rock and roll song makes you feel like you know how it's just like it's so immediate right and it's only three minutes and every emotion is in there and it's hard to sustain that over like 400 pages but I would really love to try you could pull that off I mean oh yeah I'd be well, I think I think that's it, right? Yeah, I think we're about out of time, but like at the end. Um, um, is 
thank you, Talia, for like agreeing to write for Joy Love and for us. You are brilliant. We're so, so happy that this book is in the world. Um, and it, it means more to us than I, don't, I think you actually realize. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you both so much. It's honestly such a pleasure to work with you both. And I'm so excited to be a part of this and, and also thrilled that the book is pink, which is really just the cherry on top of everything. <laughs> um, but making this book, the fact that this book exists, that it's with Joy Revolution, I love it. So thank you. Thanks. And thank you guys for coming and listening to us chit chat. Um, I think this is going to be up on the Barnes and Noble page. Yeah. Facebook page. It'll go up on YouTube or something. The interwebs. All right. Somewhere. Yeah. Um, so just search for it. Um, tell all your friends about it. Um, and thanks for spending your evening with us. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.